Hi there, you're with BQ Prime and this is the fine print. The government released the, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022 on Friday. It's a 24-page crisp bill. And one of the biggest criticisms of the bill so far has been that it leaves too much to delegated legislation. I have with me Rahul Madhan of Tri-Legal to help us understand if the bill makes the life of users like you and I, or as I refer to, as data principles any easier. Rahul, welcome to The Fine Print, and thank you for finding time to speak with us today. Uh, Rahul, first, uh, the bare reading of the bill without sort of too much application, does it seem like a comprehensive bill to you? <laughs> Look, I, I mean, I, I, I heard your introduction, and I think uh, the, the challenge with doing something like this is you're never going to get it right. Uh, when we, when Justice Sri Krishna came out with his draft, my first comment was, why are you giving us something so complex? Uh, we're just starting out into this data protection uh, journey in this country, and you're giving us a GDPR style law. And then every successive draft has become more and more complex until everyone joined in the chorus with me and said, look, this is too complex. We need to get something which is simple. And now we've got something simple, and everyone is joining in a chorus saying, uh, it's too simple. Uh, we'll never find uh, the uh, perfect median between uh, too complex and too simple. But as far as the law is concerned, and look, I'm, since you asked me a general question, I'm going to give you a general response, and I'm sure we'll get into the details uh, over the conversation. But generally speaking, this is a good law. This is a law that covers the things that it needs to cover. Once again, I have certain things that I think uh, we need to discuss in some more detail, but it covers what we need to cover. That's the first thing. And I think the second thing is, we uh, tend to forget that when you regulate technology, more detail is worse because technology, as we have seen in so many instances, far outstrips the ability of lawmakers to, to, uh, to legislate on. And so for a while, I've been talking about principle-based legislation, that we've got to legislate principles and then have agile governance in order to deal with evolving uh, technologies. And so for a principle-based framework, you need to have simple laws that can then be acted upon uh, in response to the changing directions in which technology moves. One could argue, Rahul, that that gives too much leeway to the executive then without any deliberation, without any conversation in the parliament to then go ahead and legislate as it deems fit. Yeah, look, I mean, I think there are safeguards for all of that, right? You have to work within first the constitution. You have to work within then the interpretation of the constitution, which in this case is the Puttaswami judgment. Below that, you have the principles that are laid out in the statute. After that, in order to address new technologies that keep coming up, I mean, you know, I don't want to uh, beat a, a dead horse, but metaverse, for example. If you now bring in metaverse and you say, how are we going to apply some of these principles to the metaverse? You'll find that it's going to be very hard if you have now prescribed a very specific way in which things have to be done. If instead you talk about the principles and you leave the principles in uh, and, and have you know, regulations that can come out for the metaverse, you will be able to eff effectively uh, implement this, uh, uh, this new regime. I want to go one step back, Rahul, and, you know, look at to assess where we are currently with this bill. We need to sort of uh, rejog our memories as to where it all started and what was the primary goal as we sort of this, this uh, as we did this five year extensive consultation process. The starting point was that, look, we don't have a privacy law here in India. And that needs uh, the user was at the center of that uh, attempt. Uh, now it seems to have meandered. Uh, into a completely different direction where the bill, at least it seemed to me, is trying to regulate data fiduciaries and the user is not front and center as the objective uh, or the, or the let's say, the primary consumer of that bill. I don't see how you're getting to, to that conclusion. I think the user is very much front and center of this bill as well. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, the user having all of his or her data is meaningless. The most important thing you have to do is when the user interacts with data fiduciaries, what are the rights that the user has over his or her data when it is in, con in the control of the data fiduciary? And so if there is a lot of provision, if there are a lot of provisions around what data fiduciaries need to do, it is, it is right because that is the way in which the user's rights get enforced. 
you have to look at what the user can do once the data has been collected or in the process of the collection or once it's been collected and is subsequently being processed. That's where all the rights of the, uh, of the user really uh, uh, you know, be, uh, are articulated and that's where we really need to make sure that the user is armed with the rights that it needs. Okay, I'll come to the rights in a bit. I just want your quick first thoughts also on the data that this sick, the, the bill seems to cover. And uh, it's essentially digital data and that's come out in, let's say, you know, the nomenclature of the bill as well. Uh, help me understand that in sort of saying that it will cover digital data, it is said that non-automated uh, data will be out of the purview. Uh, what is the attempt or the thought here? Well, it's not uh, It's not a departure from the way the rest of the world thinks about it. I think the real problem with data, see, we've been we've been having uh, uh, data of all sorts you know, since uh, I think Harappan times. Uh, it, there is data uh, that is being collected uh, from people. It's just the nature of commerce, it's the nature of our interactions in society. But none of that data is dangerous because it's you're, you're not capable uh, in the in the very nature of the data to um, use it at scale. Once we digitize data, uh, we had the ability to use the data at scale, and it is at that point in time, uh, with the you know with the invention of the calculating machines by IBM, that you started to see regulations uh, come in to do something about the use of it. It wasn't called big data in those days, but certainly digital data. Um, I think there's always been an exception for domestic processing. There's always been an exception for manual processing. The example that I often give is that if I'm um, putting together a birthday party for my child, I will be collecting data of all the people that I'm going to, you know, I don't know, give uh, gifts to, uh, uh, return gifts to. I can't be now uh, classified as a data processor. That's a manual process and that's very much part of um, the, the ordinary interactions with people. But when you collect digital data, that's when you can exploit it at scale and that's when individuals need to be protected and data fiduciaries need to be curbed. Sure, the example that you gave, I think, will fall in the exception of personal or domestic purpose. Uh, right. What I'm trying to understand is, at scale, what is this non-automated processing of personal data uh, that's sought to be excluded? Uh, so, I mean, as long as it is automated, you will be able to come up with all the things that we're concerned about, which is insights, profiles, all of those sorts of things. When it is not automated, it's actually incredibly hard to come up with those sorts of things that could cause harm. Okay, all right. So let's come to now how uh, you said that, you know, you think or you continue to believe that users are at the front and center of, uh, let's say, what this bill is seeking to legislate. Uh, help me understand this. Uh, there is a concept of consent and then there is a deemed consent. Uh, what are the practical implications now of this distinction? So, you know, this is one of the, one of the, uh, and now I'm going to put this on Justice Sri Krishna's head because I think uh, he started this trend. Uh, which is defining terms which are understood in the global data protection parlance in a new way. And that's what we've done with, uh, with this concept of deemed consent. This is nothing new. This has been in the law for, for a very long time around the world. I can point to the provisions of GDPR and even before that has this. So Justice Sri Krishna rechristened data subjects and called them data principles, rechristened data controllers, called them data fiduciaries. This law is rechristening the concept of legitimate purpose and uh, of reasonable purpose and legitimate interest as deemed consent. Now, uh, around the world, uh, it is well recognized in among data uh, data protection practitioners, people who are actually doing the nuts and bolts of this, that uh, consent cannot be the only grounds for processing. Uh, one of the failings of our law was that we uh, spent too, we had too much of an emphasis on uh, consent as the primary, and I would argue in later drafts, the only ground for processing. But as a matter of fact, there are various instances where uh, reasonable processing is accepted. If you look at the uh, illustrations that are provided uh, in the law, the illustrations talk about the fact that if you, are, uh, if you call a restaurant and make a, a reservation, uh, there is a deemed consent that that uh, information that you gave, which is your telephone number, can be used by the restaurant to call you back and say, look, yes, you can, you, your reservation is confirmed or it's cancelled or where are you? And you can't, as someone who has voluntarily provided their, your number, uh, go to the data protection authority or in this case, the data protection board and, and complain that your privacy has been violated because the restaurant called you to tell you that your reservation is cancelled or, or, or whatever. Now, that's one example, but there are many such examples of what 
the data protection world understands as uh, the legitimate interests. And this is something that um, uh, you know anyone who's been in the field actually found lacking in all our previous uh, provisions because it, uh, it, it then makes a, a lot of what we take for granted completely unworkable. And none of us wants to have to provide consent every minute of the day for every single thing uh, that we're using. And this is what the law from GDPR onwards recognizes, that this is the way in which the uh, data protection laws actually need to work. But uh, Rahul just uh, wanted to understand, look, they've put in sort of, again, it will be notified that what will be in the deemed consent universe, a legitimate purpose of fair and reasonable, what can be sort of reasonably expected to come out of this? And do you see any, let's say, uh, exploitative fears uh, come through uh, when you talk about deemed consent here? I mean, I think the, the problem really is that we're using this word deemed consent because deemed consent sounds like you are usurping my uh, autonomy and assuming consent on my behalf. But if you look at the way that clause is drafted, and if you look at the substance of the provision, the substance of the provision aligns much, clo much closer with the concept of legitimate interest. And if you, if you are to interpret it on the basis of the substance, I don't, find, I don't have this fear. If you are to interpret it based on the title, which is deemed consent, of course, there is the fear because it sounds deeply creepy. But I mean, and, and this is the reason why I started out by saying, and I'm sure he's, if he's listening, he's going to be very upset with me, that Justice Shri Krishna started this trend. We started calling things in India, these, these new terms. And as a result, we have got down, got to this point where uh, instead of recognizing internationally acceptable terms that we can then reference, you know, uh, jurisprudence, uh, cases, interpretations from the ECJ and things like that, we're now stuck in this in this place where we're going to have to, uh, you know, people like me are going to have to come and draw parallels between uh, this in terms of art uh, to try and say this is what was meant. I, I just wish we could make it simpler. But the government always had the option. I mean, they have veered away from a lot of Justice Sri Krishna and even the JPC recommendations. So nothing stopped them from, you know, if you really think that, you know, this no, no, language I, was problematic. You know, to, to be clear, I, I, I can't really uh, blame Justice Sri Krishna for deemed consent because there was never in his, in his con yeah. uh, conceptualization. But yeah. I'm just talking about this idea that we've had ever since uh, that first draft that we can define things in a new way uh, when we don't need to, when there are standard terms, state, you know, terms of the art that exist in data protection. So look, this is the other concern I have, Paisumi, with this. We are, as a country, uh, really grappling with uh, data protection because we're taking baby steps. We haven't even learned to walk. At, at this stage, we're making uh, rudimentary errors like naming things uh, you know, in ways that no one in the world does. Now, these are the sorts of mistakes that we will make as a nation that is just starting out with data protection. And from that perspective also, just to go back to your first question, I think a simple draft is what we need to get us going. I, I, um, I wrote on, on uh, social media some time back, this is a data protection law on training wheels. And this is exactly what we need at this stage. If we can make it principle-based, we can uh, ratchet up the compliance, we can ratchet up all of the other provisions as we go along. But to start with a extremely complex uh, GDPR type framing would be very, very counterproductive at our stage of development. Okay, I take your point, but at the heart of it, like I said, Rahul, the attempt is to improve our digital lives and make it more safer and give me more say in how my data is getting used, right? So now there are two concepts here, data fiduciary, which is uh, the person who really determines the purpose and you know means of processing personal data and maybe hands it over to a data processor who is processing the personal data on behalf of the data fiduciary. Uh, the bill places a set of obligations on both. Uh, how do you believe uh, you know, once this bill in this shape becomes the law, uh, it will improve uh, the rights of the users or the life of the users. But today we're just, you know, sort of uh, mindlessly giving access uh, to a lot of our personal data. Look, that I, I'm sorry to say, I don't think it's going to stop. GDPR, the most uh, detailed, onerous regulation in the world, uh, ha has been enacted. When it was enacted, we all got little pop-ups saying, please accept, accept. After the first three, we all accepted. We, we didn't take it any more mindfully, uh, and we still do it with the cookie pop-ups. So this is the fundamental problem uh, with a consent-based uh, framework, and I think 
uh, if you if you're expecting this to be a magic bullet, I don't think it's going to be a magic bullet from an autonomy perspective. I think the fact that we have a law which now has some teeth, it actually has consequences, um, and there are uh, various compliance obligations. Like if you uh, are above a, a certain threshold, you have to appoint a data protection officer. There are things now that companies need to do, and just that, just the fact that there is a there are obligations that they have to follow is going to make our lives safer. I think from here, we uh, need to see what the Data Protection Board uh, will do because a lot of the implementation of this is going to come from, you know, a lot of the guidance the Data Protection Board is going to give uh, that companies will then need to abide by uh, as, you know, as they, as they go forward. So I think um, uh, this is sort of uh, certainly much better than the position that we had. As you, as you know, we have uh, rules under the Information Technology Act that are completely toothless because you've got rules, it's got obligations, but not complying with those obligations have absolutely no consequence. So yeah. if you want to know what it has been, it has made better, at the very least, it is this. It is a proper statute, which has got a regulatory framework and it has got consequences. That, it, to my mind, is enough. Okay, I'll come to the consequences. Uh, they've sort of... Uh... If you remember, uh, of course, the earlier drafts had uh, the distinction between uh, personal data and critical personal data. That distinction here is gone. A fresh distinction in terms of fiduciary has been added. And sort of, uh, I, I think it's coming from what we have in the social media platform stage, where there is a data fiduciary and a significant data fiduciary. And the significant data fiduciary will then have a data protection officer. They'll have to do some, have some audit mechanism, independent audit mechanisms. But how that significant data fiduciary will get sort of categorized, there are a bunch of sort of grounds for this about pertaining to the volume of data that you can, uh, that you are uh, sort of processing, uh, the kind of data and et cetera, et cetera. And if, let's say, to the extent of even saying that if the data that you're processing has uh, electoral consequences, all of the, that will make you a SDF. What is the purpose of making this distinction, Rahul? Because uh, the person who is processing data of, 10 uh, individuals versus who's doing for 1,000, uh, both, shouldn't both have the same standards? Yes, they should. And, and look, I mean, I think uh, we need to see what the thresholds are. But once again, this concept of uh, coming up with a different category of, uh, you know, in, in the European context, it's a data controller, is not new. If you look at Europe's new uh, digital strategy, they have a very similar framework. They have a categorization of... Uh, I think they, they also call it significant data controllers, but they have a category uh, of uh, uh, regulations that would apply uh, to people, because to entities, because uh, of the nature of their business and the impact that they could have on a large number of people. And if you think about it, there are many ways in which you could say that um, data protection or uh, data businesses could harm people. But one of the biggest ways in which they could harm people is harm people at scale. Because at that, you know, when they're harming people at scale, it's actually very difficult to control them. Uh, people in all uh, parts of the planet, people in all parts of the country could be affected uh, by the decisions of a significant data fiduciary. And there is a reason uh, to therefore go after them. This doesn't mean that it, you, you don't go after the small ones. But when you are trying to make a, sort of a utilitarian uh, decision as to where to deploy uh, uh, the resources you have, uh, you have more bang for the buck going after those that can make a bigger difference to a larger number of people. And I think that is the, the purpose uh, behind this. I don't think, in a sense, it, it dilutes the obligations on everyone else. It just places this category at a higher bar and, and obliges them to do more, uh, which is fair. And it's, once again, it's not, uh, it's not uncommon in, in the rest of the world. Yeah, and I mean, look, there is, uh, I can see some logic in terms of saying that, look, smaller businesses, why place these onerous requirements on them and let the big ones sort of... Uh, I think know, I think we need to make a distinction because small businesses still do have obligations. Regardless of your size, you have yeah. obligations. If you cross a threshold, you will have more obligations. What are those obligations? Those obligations are, you have to designate someone to whom we can complain if there's a problem. Nothing wrong with that. You yeah. have to conduct audits. Nothing wrong with that. Now, those are the sorts of things that perhaps you don't want to burden a small business with because it costs to, uh, you know, create a person and a job just for the purpose of receiving complaints. Uh, so I think those are the those are the sorts of um, uh, additional obligations that I think are, are quite reasonable with regard to um, large businesses. 
Okay, just to circle back to my original point, uh, why have they done away with the critical personal data versus personal data distinction? As in, um, do you see the logic uh, in not, I mean, not defining it uh, or making these two categorizations and then just clubbing everything into the data set or rather the definition of personal data? Yeah, look, I mean, okay, so I, I want to be clear that you are asking me the right question because critical data was something that, uh, was you know just as Sri Krishna introduced into the law and he himself uh, when I asked him said I wish I had defined it because it remained undefined it remains undefined all the way until the 2021 draft so no one knows what critical personal data means perhaps what you mean is sensitive personal data because sensitive personal data has been uh, in the law uh, since the beginning it is a, uh, a slightly higher uh, uh, has a slightly higher threshold and um, there are there is a legitimate uh, argument as to uh, why we haven't distinguished between personal data and sensitive personal data. I think the point really is that sensitive personal data, uh, there are some categories of data that require greater protection. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, do we do we classify them, give them uh, a little more protection, uh, perhaps prevent them from being transferred um, out of the country to unfriendly nations, things like that. But there is certainly an argument uh, for that. Once again, as I said, we this is uh, a country that has that needs training wheels as far as its data protection uh, law is concerned. Uh, the only protection that we can really uh, reasonably offer sensitive personal data is what we call explicit consent. Uh, if you have read my writings and you have talked to me on numerous occasions, I don't hold much store with the protection that consent provides. So if I don't hold store with the, the protection that consent alone provides, I think uh, explicit consent is not going to really give me you know, that much more safety. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, what it is going to do is put fetters on, on what we, uh, you know, on, the, on the way we work. How should we go from here? I think certainly as the, uh, as the regime matures, as the, uh, you know, the regulator comes to grips with all the things that India needs, we should absolutely consider uh, some sorts of personal data as deserving of more protection than others. But we need to do that in the context of what our regulatory en en enforcement mechanism is, what our, what our infrastructure is to be able to actually give people this meaningful uh, protection. Otherwise, right now there, there is zero protection for any form of data. Let's at least get that sorted. And once we've got that sorted, we can move up the chain uh, to get greater protection for others. No, I'm saying that the concept existed until the last draft. So, uh, I mean, why do away with it? Because like you mentioned that- It's all theoretical, Payaswini. Until it actually comes, into force, it doesn't exist. I mean, I've been writing, I've been looking at these laws since 2012, uh, and all of these things have existed. I don't, I don't necessarily fault this law because they have this one definition. It would have been nice if there are two. I can understand uh, the the uh, thinking of the government, which is we are going to have a tough time getting this off the ground. We are just remember for a country our size. We are literally the last country in the world to have a data protection law. I think there are some minor countries that don't, but but a country which is so digital first to not have a data protection law, uh, we really have to catch up. Um, and I think we need to get the basics done. Uh, and so I'm not going to fault uh, the the government for uh, having just personal data. I think we we need to move. Uh, and once we move, once we uh, see how it works, we can add belts and braces, we can add additional provisions at a later point in time. Okay, so let's now come to user rights, which you think are, uh, you know, sufficient in the current uh, bill. Uh, there are one or two which existed in the earlier versions, like the right to data votability, which has been deleted. Uh, there is, I think, in the earlier versions, we also had the provision of compensation if there has been a data breach, so that has been deleted. Uh, but rights like right to get your data corrected or deleted or the right to be forgotten, they continue to exist. Uh, in practical terms, do we have, in terms of rights, sufficient uh, in this in this bill? Yeah, so this is the one thing that I'm a, a little disappointed about. I, you know, I think the right to data portability is extremely important. Um, it is the direction in which data protection laws around the world are going. Uh, you know, we've had the right to data portability for a while uh, since 2016, actually in the law in GDPR. But he, from even before that, this concept has existed. And Europeans, the European digital strategy is doubling down on the right to data portability with these data spaces and things like that they're, that they're creating. Uh, California has got a strong data portability provision. 
um, uh, the OECD has got working groups on, on data portability. So to find that missing in this uh, law, I, it was a bit of a disappointment to me. I think, uh, you know, particularly since India has got powerful data digital data transfer uh, uh, infrastructure um, like DEPA and, uh, you know, ONDC that we've spoken about on this, on this program, uh, we really need to have a right to data portability uh, in the law. If you look through the provisions, it's there. You know, it's hidden, it's hidden under a carpet somewhere. And you can string it together with a lot of provisions. I don't, I don't think it's completely missing, um, but I would have liked to see it front and center uh, as a right to data portability. I think, uh, you know, uh, compensation, um, uh, not just for data breach, but compensation also for any harm that's caused. We've got, a, I think, a, a good definition of harm now um, in the law, the, the previous definition was just um, uh, too large, uh, too too sweeping. Uh, this one seems to be a lot more measured. And I think uh, when we have a definition of harm, it would be nice to see some consequences for harm. Uh, the con consequences for harm right now are just penalties. But um, you know, the people who are harmed don't really get anything out of it. So to have some sort of a, a provision uh, uh, of compensation, even if it's uh, just a, 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 a thin uh, line which says that you're entitled to to compensation for the harm suffered, I think uh, would be would be a good thing. Um, I don't know if you're going to come to this, but I heard your Twitter Spaces yesterday, and uh, there was a discussion around uh, data breach. Um, and I think uh, people are uh, happy that uh, the data breach notification now extends to uh, all the affected uh, data principles. I think this would be extremely dangerous. Uh, I don't think uh, uh, you know ordinary uh, users are aware of the volume of data breaches that happen, particularly since the definition of data breach is so broad. That You're just referring to the fact that data fiduciary will need to uh, inform the data principle of that breach. That's the point you're right. referring to. Right now, the obligation is, I mean, I mean the, the obligation was that the uh, data regulator, uh, the data protection authority, now the data protection board needs to be notified. Uh, in this draft, there's also an obligation to notify all the affected uh, uh, individuals. And the reason I have a problem with that is that, um, you know, the, the standard around the world, Europe, for example, uses the standard of you inform the data uh, principle or the data subject in Europe uh, when there is a high risk that their rights and freedoms will be affected. Now, the nature of data breach, given the definition of data breach, is that even if I leave my laptop in a taxi, uh, I have lost access to the data in that laptop. And even if the taxi driver has no way to open it and see the information in it, it constitutes a data breach. Now, at this point in time, when no harm is, has been caused to the uh, individuals in that, uh, you know, whose data I have in that laptop, do we call them and tell them, look, I think your data is stolen. Do you want to create this sort of a panic? There are hundreds of incidents like this that happen in companies around the world. And please understand that, that data exists everywhere. So to actually create a regime where every time there is a data breach, as defined in the law, everyone gets notified. Uh, one, you're going to cause panic. Um, two, after the initial panic, people are not going to pay attention. And so when there is a real data breach, they're going to say, oh, okay, this is just another one of those laptops left in a car. This is not the regime that we want. We've got to have a more nuanced regime around data breach notification because it's these small innocuous provisions of the law that are murder to implement when you are a company uh, trying to uh, uh, do the right thing uh, by uh, your 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 customers. Okay, so you'd like to see some safeguards around or sort of, let's say, thresholds around when that breach should be notified to the data principal. And once again, just what the international standard is. I'm not asking for anything uh, unusual. I think, you know, let's just look. Uh, we're learning. We're, we're just learning to walk. Um, others uh, are doing, you know, backflips. We just need to see what they do, uh, use their principles, uh, and you know, learn as we go. Uh, and then we will evolve things that are unique for our uh, culture, for for our requirements. Uh, without a doubt, we should uh, implement all of that. I've saved the best sort of umbrella topic for last travel, and that is to do with exemptions. Uh, now, uh, you know, that has been like the pet sort of ask of all civil rights activists that have safeguards, have an oversight mechanism, don't have sweeping, uh, you know, state exemptions, not only state exemptions in this bill, we also have uh, the central get, uh, government getting empowered to notify specific data fiduciaries, uh, maybe even in the private sector where, you know, these, uh, these uh, 
very, uh, let's say, onerous obligations, if even were to see it, uh, will not become applicable. Uh, there are situations where, let's say, where there is investigation or where there is, you know, a prosecution or for prevention of even an offense, uh, this the provisions of the law will not get applicable. Uh, I mean, does it not read white to you? <laughs> no, look, I mean, um, I, I think that I think, OK, so let, let me play. Place it, uh, let me place it in as charitable a light as I can. Uh, the fact that the law does My not... My is not charitable at all of you, just please go ahead. I'm not being charitable to you. I, I, know, I, know the, I, I know the voices ranged against me, and most of the voices ranged against me are uh, civil liberties. And so I, you know, I completely see where they're coming from. Because uh, if, you're a, if you're a civil uh, liberties, civil rights uh, lawyer, essentially what you're doing is you're taking the government to task. But when you're taking the government to task, you have many weapons, many arrows in your quiver, starting with the constitution. Nothing this law does or does not do is going to erode the rights that you have in the constitution. Subsequently, you have Puttaswami. The fact that you have an exemption or not, Puttaswami is going to ensure that you can actually uh, you know, do what Puttaswami allows you to do. But I don't want to go down that path. I want to, I want to talk about the, you know, the, the way in which this law uh, and the exemptions that we have here uh, and, and just our whole history of exemptions in all the laws that have come, drafts that have come up to now, uh, have, have evolved. Justice Krish Shri Krishna's draft had exemptions. Those exemptions were panned because everyone says, oh my goodness me, we're giving so many exemptions. And then when the next version, the 2019 draft came, that actually had uh, you know, what in 21 became section 35, which was not just an exemption. It basically said the entire act does not apply to certain types of agencies. And when everyone saw that, they said, look, let's go back to Justice Shri Krishna. That was not as bad as this is. And now we've effectively gone back to, to Justice Shri Krishna's version, where we've got a provision where there are exemptions. The exemptions apply in, in uh, uh, you know, essentially what they do is they say certain provisions of this act will not apply to certain types of instances. There is no blanket exemption to agencies. Now, this, if you want to look at the global standard, I have studied maybe 100 different data protection laws around the world. Um, I don't want to talk about all of them, but if you look at GDPR, Article 23 of GDPR, and you compare the provisions of Article 23 to the provisions of uh, Section 18 of this law, you will find parallels between all of those provisions. Now, are the exact sections that uh, uh, GDPR exempts also exemptive? Maybe not. Maybe there's more. Maybe there's less. But the concept of an exemption in a data protection law for things like, you know, the, the enforcement of, uh, of rights, uh, prosecution of offenses, this is standard. Every data protection law has an exemption. To, to think that a data protection law would not have an exemption is, uh, is daft. There is no, there no, is no it's law not, in the country. I'm not that I think Rahul arguing that it shouldn't have any protect. I mean, even like you said, Justice Sri Krishna also said that you need state exemption. Right. But what you also need in the parent legislation is some sort of an oversight mechanism or safeguards to say, hey, look, when you're seeking this exemption, you uh, there is a ju judicial oversight of it. None of that is there in this bill. Well, who said we need a judicial oversight of it? You always have a judicial oversight. Every time you do something, uh, lawyers will be beating down the doors of the Supreme Court to say this needs to be struck down. So that is judicial oversight. Now, do you want to create a new judicial entity whose sole job is to sit on a, every regulation that the data protection that the central government does under data protection. I don't see us doing this in any other type of legislation. But I mean, here at the heart of it is the data principle and 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 sort of uh, the scale of this uh, legislation in terms of who it affects is massive. So would you not want when an enforcement agency uh, decides to collect data, would you not want, and even in the criminal jurisprudence, would you not want that uh, enforcement agency to have any oversight? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there are oversight and the guidelines that the central government has to follow when they are taking these exemptions have been laid down in the Supreme Court when the, when the Puttaswami judgment interpreted the fundamental rights. Those guidelines cannot be uh, uh, deviated from by the central government. If they do, then why hasn't they will be held up. I don't see what the point is putting it in the law when these rights exist. And, and even if you put it in the law, right, even if we say that, your remedy is ultimately going to be back in the Supreme Court. 
Because having said that they will do A, B, C, if they don't do it, there's nothing you can do. You basically have to go to the court. And so my, my point is not to minimize this. My point is just to say, one, exemptions exist in every law. To now uh, fight over the exact language, you know, do we have reasonable, the word reasonable here or not, doesn't matter if you have reasonable or not, because you have to act reasonably. That's what the Supreme Court says you have to do. Now, if I, if I say I, uh, I, act, I, I will act reasonably, and actually I didn't act reasonably, you have a remedy. If I don't say I should act re uh, reasonably and I, and I don't act reasonably, you still have a remedy. There is nothing that is being harmed by the fact that the word reasonable is not in this, uh, in this legislation. You may say that it points to intent. Okay, maybe it does point to intent, but then actually don't catch them on, uh, on you know, this, this imagination that they have this intent. The first time the government does something wrong, go after them, go to court. Okay, I mean, go to court, uh, Rahul. I mean, in the in a sort of environment that we are currently in, uh, it's it's not always the remedy uh, that you know uh, will. I fully appreciate that, but I, let me just let, let me just let me just actually tell you what the situation that we really in that we're really in is right now. For ten years, we have known that there is a need for a data protection law, uh, and for the last five years, we've been vacillating back and forth between. Too complex, too simple, too many exemptions, too few exemptions. To my mind, we've got a law which in many ways addresses the way in which technology needs to be regulated, which is, as I started out saying, simple, principle-based legislation that allows you to get the, get the ball rolling. We can, of course, debate this and say, no, this is, this is too simple. We want to get it a little more complex, but it will take us another year. Are we willing to do that? Well, the answer to that is obviously no, because we want this law to be sort of enacted as soon as possible. And hence, uh, you know, the, the constant ask of the civil society, hey, look, where is it reached? The JPC took forever to submit, uh, you know, its bills, so, which is why everybody was getting anxious. And now uh, what I, I mean, Rahul, people seem to believe is that, look, you started with, like, as Apar mentioned in our Twitter spaces conversation, you started with 90 clauses, you've crunched it down to a 24 page uh, document, which seems very skeletal at this stage, because, you know, we don't know, even, let's say, for industry to sort of prepare, and that's a separate conversation. Uh, we don't know much for civil society to say, hey, look, is it good? Is it bad? We don't know, because there's not much in here in terms of details and specifics uh, for people to even make up their mind that, you know, even on intent. Uh, that whether this is, you know, with this will do the job or not. So, I, I mean, first of all, I, I contest the uh, statement that uh, 90 pages makes a good law. Uh, no, it doesn't. If you I'm can't, just, no, of course not. That's not and the... Therefore, and therefore the argument, and therefore the argument that it, just because a law has been written in 24 pages, uh, instead of commending uh, the draftsman of ha uh, for, the, for the ability to actually say in 24 pages what previously was said in 90, uh, we say that, no, this is not good enough. When? When it was 90, we said, oh, God, this is too complicated. No, the I, consequence I mean, is that the, is that is we don't have 50. too much in terms of details, Rahul. Nobody is saying that don't have, uh, you know, brevity shouldn't be at the center of legislation. Of course, it should be. But in the interest of brevity, you can't leave everything to notifications, I think, is the short point that, this, that you know. But the, look, I mean, I, I, mean I, I, heard, I heard this statement that kept coming up, right, that uh, to be prescribed has been used 18 times. Uh, this is, you know, it's now become a bit of a meme. Uh, and. And, and, you know, if you look at that and if you, if you actually count the 18 times, yes, some of those to be, to be prescribed are uh, perhaps things that we could, have, we could have included. Many of them are not. Generally, a lot of things have to be prescribed later. Uh, substantive provisions should be written in the law. And if you were to really get into the details of that, of all those 18 times that it has been written, I would say maybe three or four times we have a real debate on our hands. Everything else is the nature of legislation. You have to have some things in the law, something left for delegated legislation. And so to, you know, I, I, this, is the, this is sort of the concern I have. I have looked through the law and I agree there are things missing. I agree the data portability is missing. There is also the right to be forgotten. To, to my mind, I think that was well left because the right to be forgotten is an advanced provision of law. You need to have a well-working data protection law in order to be able to go to right to, to be forgotten. So there are some things that should be in. There are some things that are not. Generally speaking, in 24 pages, they have covered, to my mind, a lot of what is needed. I don't believe that because it's not 90 pages that we don't have the detail that we need. We have the detail we need. 
and particularly since uh, technology regulation needs to, you need to adopt this sort of, a, a, you look at the principles and then evolve the principles based on what technology is throwing at you approach. It is the only way to go. I, you know, you know this, I've said this, I, I've written about this. Uh, I, I think the big mistake that we all make is writing too much. Because when we write too much, the very next day, my clients come to me and say, okay, this new law has come out. It's got these specific provisions. I've got a technology that, um, you know, previously, because it was silent, there was, it didn't matter, but now it does matter. And so therefore we, if we can stick to principles and uh, allow those principles to be implemented in accordance with the direction that technology takes us, we will be better off. As always, Rahul, ending with this optimism of yours that uh, what, we have our sound principles and maybe what we all fear um, would surprise us as notification would probably not. Uh, so of course, we'll come back to you as uh, those 18s to be prescribed get notified and this law becomes uh, this law becomes a reality. Thank you, Rahul, for finding the time to speak with us with your initial thoughts. Uh, and we'll stay on top of all those notifications that keep coming back to you uh, for, on how they're going to play out. Thank you for joining us here on The Fine Print and thank you so much for watching.